I sure hope you all had a fantastic summer season, but now that we're in the fall and with those colder months ahead, I thought I'd take a look back and share some of the more unsettling stories that my listeners have sent to me. I'm still combing through my messages, and there are a whole lot more out there that I'll be sharing eventually, but for now, bundle up, light some candles, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and throw another log on the fire, cause tonight, it's storytelling time. A few summers ago, my hiking buddy Rogers and I spent the weekend backpacking in the Trinity Wilderness. This was our second time out there, but we decided to take a different route to get to our destination. The route we took was longer and a bit more treacherous than the one we'd taken before, but that was half the fun for us, looking for new ways to do old things. So on that second day, we broke down our campsite and begin our long day's trek. It was a hot August day and the sun was bearing down as it normally would be this time of year. A few miles up the trail we decided to cut through a grove of trees to get some shade and continue along the trail just on the other side of it. This trail wasn't man-made at all but more like a deer trail. We doubted that anyone else had been out here for more than several decades. It was pristine. Well, about 15 minutes into this patch of forest, Rogers kneeled down and pulled something out of the dirt. I went over to him and saw that he was holding a piece of blue fiberglass. It was old and faded, and we had no idea what it was. We kept on, but it wasn't long before I spotted something this time. Another blue object, and slightly larger than what Rogers had found. I brushed off the dirt and the two of us examined it. We saw what looked like old paint and the letters ALN painted on the side of it. And it appeared to be missing other letters as well. This piece was about 3 by 5 inches in size. And after we discussed it, it reminded us of an old piece of boat. But a boat out here in the wilderness. Your guess is as good as ours. But here's where things get a bit strange. In this patch of cold and quiet forest, we spotted dozens more of these objects. Some just like the first ones we found, and others much larger. The largest one we found was about the size of an ice chest. These were no doubt relics from an old boat. Or more likely, several boats. But that wasn't the strangest part. We find an orange-spotted, sun-bleached life vest, like one of the older kinds from the 70s. But how on earth did all this get out here? It was as if a tornado had come through and shredded a bunch of boats, and throwing out pieces all over the forest. We found old wiring and even a partial glass windshield. There were even bits and pieces hanging from certain trees. On top of that, We even found propeller and motor parts. But again, why out here? There were no old logging roads that we knew about. No access, except by foot. Also, there were no lakes and no bodies of water anywhere close by. And we were in the heart of the Trinity Wilderness. However, we did find one clue though. Possibly where all these came from. One of the pieces we found had RMUD inscribed on the side of it. At first, RMUD didn't mean much of anything to us, but later on after we left the area, it just sort of jumped out and slapped us. We discussed what the missing letters could be and we both agreed that it could have read Bermuda at one point. Bermuda, as in the infamous Bermuda Triangle where all those boats, planes, and people vanished without a trace. I don't know. What do you all think? Rogers and I plan on going back to the old boat cemetery next summer to do some more investigating. But still, this has always bothered me as to how and why they ended up where they did out there in that wilderness.
Just this last June, I spent about a week at an Airbnb located in a fairly remote part of Maine, just about an hour northeast of Portland, Maine. I was there to attend a friend's wedding and to enjoy the local beaches, which were only about a 10 minute drive away. The Airbnb I was staying at was right off the main road, and next to it was a large pond called Sprague Pond. Apparently there's a trail that takes you down to the pond, around it and right back up to the parking area, which only takes about 15 to 20 minutes if you were to hike it. It's a small and simple trail, and the parking lot is only large enough for about a half a dozen vehicles or so. You can't see the pond from the main road because it's covered by a thick forest, but from where I was staying at the Airbnb, it connects directly to the back of the property and it's much more visible. Tourist season was really beginning to kick into gear, and from that first day I arrived, I saw just how busy that little pond was, and the parking lot was always filled to capacity. I must have passed by it three or four times a day. I would leave in the morning and return later that evening, and saw the constant changing of cars and trucks in that parking lot. Not that I really cared, it's just something you pick up when you're staying next to a nature preserve. On the second day of my stay, I saw a newer tan colored SUV that had been there the night before. I remember seeing it as I came back that previous evening, just before sunset. I figured whoever owned it decided to revisit the park for whatever reason. But the vehicle was parked exactly like they were before on the far left of the parking lot and slightly crooked. I just brushed it off and went about my day. Well, I returned later that night and saw it again. It hadn't moved. So I'm thinking the vehicle broke down and someone would return later to come get it. It's common sense that you don't want to leave your vehicle unattended for too long or bad things can happen to it. So when I left the Airbnb on the morning of the third day, it was still there. And when I returned that evening, again, it hadn't moved. So there it was, three days and that car hadn't moved an inch. I began thinking, what if something bad had happened to the owner? Could he or she be in any trouble? Was I the only one to notice this seemingly abandoned vehicle? I decided to investigate a little further, so I pulled up next to it. At that point, the sun was about to disappear below the horizon, and I probably only had about 30 minutes of daylight left. I got out and walked over to the SUV. It had New York plates on it, and inside there was a purple jacket on the back seat and a bottle of Aquafina in the driver's side cup holder. Other than that, it was pretty empty inside. So I decided the best thing to do was report it. I got on the phone with the local police and told them about the car and how it had been sitting there for the last few days. Apparently, I wasn't the only one to notice after all because a few others had called it in too. The officer over the phone then told me that they're still trying to locate the owner of the vehicle if I see any changes to update them as soon as possible. Alright, well that's good, at least they're aware of the situation. But I kept thinking, what happened to this person? And why would they leave their nice car sitting in a nature preserve parking lot for three days? I went back to the Airbnb, and as I set out the next day, I saw a flurry of activity in that parking lot. That tan SUV was now sitting on the back of a tow truck, and there were two local police cruisers there as well as search and rescue. I saw about five of them having a discussion, and noticed a search dog next to one of the guys. So I put two and two together and figured they were there to go look for the owner of that vehicle. The parking lot was blocked off by a set of orange construction cones, and there was a closed sign in between both of them. This told me the seriousness of the situation. 
I pulled up to the guys and asked them about the missing person, but they didn't give me much information. They just said they're looking for a middle-aged guy who went missing while taking his dog for a walk down the trail. The following day, the park was still closed, but there was nobody there. I was thinking, maybe they found the guy, but why would the park be closed off still? Was a crime committed here? The next day, Sprague Pond had reopened and was alive with tourist activity again. A couple days later, I left the Airbnb and headed back home to Boston. When I got back, I phoned the local authorities to follow up on the missing hiker, but all they could tell me was that he was still missing and that the investigation is still ongoing. They wouldn't even give me a name when I asked or if they'd found any other clues behind his disappearance, which I thought was strange. But what really haunts me is that this guy disappeared right next to where I was staying. When something like that happens, it tugs on you. To this day, they still don't know what happened to the guy, and when I inquire, the investigation is always still ongoing. In the summer of 1991, I lived in a small town called Crescent City in Northern California. When I was 12, I lived in a newly developed suburban neighborhood, surrounded by dense forest that seemed to go on forever. Well, that summer, the city had planned to build a new elementary school at the end of our street, and so they cleared out a huge forested piece of land for the school eventually expanding their efforts to include a new soccer and baseball field as well, cutting even deeper into those woods. In the evenings and on the weekends, when all the construction workers left, my buddies and I would go play on the equipment and explore some of the newly built classrooms. By this point, the freshly plowed fields that separated the school from the forest began to grow full of weeds and tall grass turning gold from baking in the hot summer sun. At that time, I remember how the field stretched on for days, like a golden sea of grass, eventually ending at the edge of those dark woods. There was always something about those woods, something I could never quite put my finger on, and I think my buddies felt the same way too because none of us went near it. Nonetheless, we continued to go back to that school and did so for most of the summer. One day, for whatever reason, my buddies weren't able to make it, so I went out there alone. As I recall, it was a hot August afternoon, and I walked over to a half-finished set of playground equipment, where I began playing. I was sitting on a swing watching my feet dipping in and out of the wood chips as I rocked back and forth, and when I looked up, I saw something emerging from the edge of those woods, and then it sort of just melted into the field. That's the only way I could describe it. It happened so quickly that I had no clue what I just saw, but I sat there frozen, fixated on that field, wondering where the hell it could have went. A moment later, it reappeared, a bit closer this time. Whatever it was, it was crawling in the grass. It must have thought that I wasn't aware of it, because it just kept creeping forward in my direction. But how could I not notice it? It stood out like a sore thumb in that grass. At this point, I felt a punch of fear in my gut telling me to get up and get out of there. As I began to do so, it rose up on two legs and looked straight at me. Now, I could see it clear as day. It was a large, German Shepherd-looking dog, but with a more pronounced snout and had sharper features. It was all one solid color, with a dark, reddish tinge, like that of redwood. But what it did next still haunts me to this day. In a child's voice, it began calling my name, nodding as it did so. 
It said my name three times and then began waving its arms, gesturing me to come over to it. And when I didn't move, it repeated this, saying my name again, followed by that wave. The sound of its voice was more playful this time, but with a hint of desperation as well. Talk about getting the creeps, like a stranger offering you candy to get inside his van. Whatever it was, it was no dog, or any animal that I know. The strangest part was I was almost hypnotized by it. Can't explain it. Was this a man dressed in an animal costume? Was it a twisted prank? The next thing I remember was running the other direction and away from that school. But just before I hit the main road, I turned back to look at it. And at this point, it dropped back down to all fours and shot back into those woods from where it came. And it did this with exceptional speed. No man in a costume could do what that thing did. I never did see that thing again, but then again, I never went back to that school until I was much older. And by that point, the school had already been open for several years. I actually went back a couple summers ago while visiting the town and noticed that most of the woods had been cleared and replaced by new homes. However, there was still a small section of forest that still remains to this day, and I can't help but wonder if those woods are hiding a dark secret. Maybe someday I'll muster up the nerve to bring some friends along and do some kind of investigation in there. I think a part of me wants answers, or at the very least, to face my childhood fears once and for all after all these years. Every summer, I'd take a trip out to Rocky Mountains National Park, usually spending a week there hitting up all my favorite old hiking spots and exploring new ones. I live in Indiana, and it usually takes me a day or two to make the trek out there. I always bring my dogs for companionship, as my wife and I divorced several years back, so I had no one else to go with. So my traveling buddies, a two-year-old golden lab named Cookie Doe and a ten-year-old Boston Terrier named Max headed out to the Rockies in early July of 2016. Just before we reached the park itself, about an hour's drive away, I pulled over at a rest stop to let the dogs out and to stretch my legs. I hadn't been to this one before, but it kind of looked abandoned, or at least in need of some serious TLC. One of the restrooms had been bolted shut, the water fountain didn't work, and looked like it hadn't been used since the Reagan administration, and the information board had been completely sunbleached by years of hot and dry weather, and you could barely read a single word on it. Of course, I was the only one there, which added to the spookiness of the place. Nonetheless, from where we were at the rest stop, you could see the mountain ranges off in the distance, and we were kind of in the middle of a small valley area. It was a pretty fantastic view regardless. Anyway, I let my dogs out and they did their business. I grabbed my frisbee and threw it out a few times for both Max and Cookie Dough, each one trying to steal it away from the other. My dogs were always full of energy and I made sure they got their exercise when I could before we hit the road again. I threw the frisbee out a few more times, each one progressively further than the throw before it. I threw it again, and watched them jet after it. I walked back to my car just a few feet away, and grabbed some drinking water for them. Then I noticed something odd. It got real quiet. Their playful growls and the clanging of their collars had stopped. And when I turned back to where my dogs had been, I couldn't see them. I couldn't hear them. Nothing. So then I whistled and slapped my hands together as I usually did. 
but there was no response. I shouted this time, saying both their names in a more scolding manner, which always got their attention. And I can hear my own voice getting more desperate and eventually falling into a whimper of sorts. Of course I ran over to where they had been and found the red frisbee laying exactly where I had thrown it. I looked all around me, and there was nowhere for them to go. I was in the middle of a valley and had clear visibility of all my surroundings. Of course, I searched in and outside of the restroom and behind every conceivable object in that area, anywhere a dog could hide behind. Nothing in and around my car either. My dogs, it seemed, had completely vanished without a trace. I remember spending another 15 or 20 minutes there, searching around the rest stop and expanding my efforts further out toward the wilderness. But at one point, I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right and that whatever happened to my dogs would happen to me if I stayed out there any longer. So I hurried back to my car, jumped in and locked the doors. I still had my windows down so that I could still call out to them. But nothing ever happened. My dogs were gone. I stayed there for over an hour, waiting and even tried calling local authorities. But I was roaming and wouldn't be able to reach them until I was long gone later that evening. I told them every detail I could remember. I told them where the rest stop was about 25 miles east of a forest service station and approximately 40 miles west of a small town called Deer Creek. I sent them over a dozen photos of Max and Cookie Dough and called just about every gas station and service center within a 50 mile stretch of that road. I spread the word like a wildfire and exhausted all my resources. But I never did hear back from anyone and the leads that I did receive turned out to be dead ends. As you might imagine, I never made it to the Rocky Mountains. I was so distraught, it wouldn't feel right to go. So after a few days of lingering in that area, and driving back and forth on that highway, and returning to that dreadful rest stop, I headed back home to Indiana. I will forever be haunted by their disappearance. It took a long time to recover, but eventually, I was ready to move forward, and now, I have two more dogs, and you can bet that they will never leave my sight again. And there you have it. Just a few more strange and downright spooky wilderness stories that my listeners have sent to me. If you're one of those folks who has a strange experience to share, feel free to send them to top10strangeworld at gmail.com and I'll do my best to check them out before too long. Thanks for listening and you'll hear from me soon. Good night.